Out of all the original films Pixar has released in the past decade or so, Brave was the one with the most potential to do something genuinely interesting. And considering how much the film gets right, I think it's really unfortunate that it's remembered as an uneven, broken film. I've thought about Brave probably more than I'd like to admit. Ever since I saw it in the cinema, I felt that it was one of those films that could have been, should have been, a lot better than it ended up being. Merida is a free-spirited, energetic princess living in medieval Scotland. She doesn't conform to the role that society expects of her. The way the societal pressure manifests itself in her life is her mother, Queen Eleanor, who is basically everything her daughter is not. The film sets up and establishes over and over again this three-way relationship between Merida, Eleanor, and the society they live in. In a sense, what the film is really about are these two conflicting views of femininity and womanhood, and how they function and interact within the society. Or as Mark Andrews, one of the directors on the film, said, Brave is a child's struggle in reconciling how the world sees them versus how they see themselves. It's important to note that at no point does Merida try to be masculine in any way. She is not Mulan, masking away her femininity to take part in these activities. Merida fully takes them on as part of her identity as a woman. It's not that she wants to be a boy. She's a girl. She likes being a girl. She just doesn't like some of the things that come with being a girl in that time. She is most free on the few off days she gets, when she's able to minimize the societal influence on her life. At these times, she embraces the feminine qualities that she likes. She still wears a dress and lets her long hair out to flow even while riding, shooting arrows and climbing. Expressing that these two sides are not contradictions, they are not mutually exclusive. To her, it is the most natural thing that they go hand in hand, that they are part of the same person. Princess does not place her weapons on the table. Mom! Eleanor, on the other hand, is eloquent, graceful. She enjoys the arts and music. She's the ideal version of femininity according to this society. And she clearly enjoys the role she plays. She owns it. You see her smile and talk about it with pride. Above all, a princess strives for, well, perfection. She's most herself when she's able to take part in all that society expects of her. However, the film also makes it clear that it doesn't place a judgment on Eleanor for her preferred version of femininity. In fact, it does the opposite, first explicitly through mocking Merida's viewpoint. I don't want to get married. I want to stay single and let my hair flow in the wind as I ride through the glen, firing arrows into the sunset. Putting it on equal footing with the mother's viewpoint. But more importantly, visually, through its storytelling. During the welcoming ceremony, this is made clear by showing her indirect power through the king. Uh, for, uh, the presentation, the of, presentation the of the suitor. But later when the whole thing collapses into a brawl, her direct power is all but stated by the film. All the queen does is walk forward sternly and everybody stops fighting. They are in such awe of her poise and grace that they literally part like the Red Sea. In this world, grace is power and the graceful queen holds all the power. My lady queen, I feel terrible. Sorry. My humblest Maybe apology. No disrespect. I'm sorry, love. I, I didn't, but... Yes, dear. Later, when Merida rebels, everybody looks at the queen for guidance, not the king. He's not even in the frame. Even Merida comes to accept this as fact later on. If we go back to the walking scene, I feel like this moment, emphasized with this close-up, was supposed to be the first moment Merida sees her mother's influence and the power in her way of life. Because along with these two opposing views of femininity are two opposing views of power, each with a different relationship to society's expectations. Eleanor, a soft power of diplomatic skill, privileged in comparison to her daughter, because society allows her to take full advantage of this power. And Merida, a hard power of physical skill, oppressed and stifled, while the men have no problem expressing that same hard power. That's attractive. In fact, setting Merida apart from the way society puts a masculine coating on her favorite activities is a point the film makes. She's clearly shown to enjoy fighting and physical activity is a release for her. But when it's framed in the context of this toxic masculinity, she just rolls her eyes. She has no interest in it this way. Compared to her father, who fucking loves this. A quick interlude about the father. 
He basically agrees with the mother and with society's expectations of his daughter. His encouraging attitude towards his daughter's subversion has more to do with a personal indulgence and his incompetence in maintaining the status quo rather than any empathetic views of his own. Princess or not, learning to fight is essential. He kind of delights in all the nonsense suffering going on. There's this throwaway line during the four-way fight. None of your sons are fit to marry my daughter! But it's not like that opinion holds any water. It feels almost like just an excuse so he can fight. He doesn't really factor into this main conflict, mostly relegated along with everyone else to the society pile. The lords are presenting their sons as suitors for your betrothal. What? The clans have accepted! Dad! What? I... I you, you just cheat! Eleanor! Honestly, Merida, I don't know why you're reacting in this way. The Queen's flaw isn't that she embraces and enjoys her role so much. It's that due to that role basically being second nature to her, she's completely blind to the fact that it goes against everything her daughter stands for. This is so natural to her that she has a warped view of this. It's not fair! Ugh, Merida, it's marriage. It's not the end of the world. The Queen is blind to the fact that she herself is extending the oppression over her daughter. Merida, on the other hand, is initially blind to the power her mother actually has, and her change must be to embrace some of what she's been taught. But to be fair to Merida, her actions aren't so much a result of her not observing correctly like her mother, as it is rebelling against the idea of being forced to live a life she doesn't want to. I suppose a princess just does what she's told! A princess does not raise her voice! Merida, this is what you've been preparing for your whole life! No! It's what you've been preparing me for my whole life! Now the whole marriage route the film starts to follow actually fits really well. It's basically society barging in and re-emphasizing its place in the stalemate between Merida and Eleanor. But to be more specific, it's society being brought in by Eleanor without even telling Merida beforehand. They're all accepted. Who's accepted what, mother? The arranged marriage plot establishes a game of wit and strategy presenting Merida opportunities to show what she is actually learning from her mother. Merida's first scene of rebellion is in a way taken right out of her mother's playbook and adapted to fit her own way of doing things. She completely plays within the rules that Eleanor sets up. Only the firstborn of each of the great leaders may be presented as champions. Firstborn? And thus, compete for the hand of the Princess of Dunbrough. She uses soft power tactics to give herself an opportunity to express herself in the hard power abilities she so prefers. It is customary that the challenge be determined by the princess herself. Archery! Archery! I choose archery. But she does this in a way that emphasizes how much she has left to learn. By humiliating everyone, she also antagonizes them, which just ends up working against her. You embarrass them. You embarrassed me! I followed the you rules! You don't know what you've done! We got a bit ahead of ourselves. Let's take a step back. So we can talk about that archery scene for a second, because it's a masterpiece. There are so many ways to talk about this sequence that I really don't even know where to start. We have the symbolism of the stifling wardrobe Merida has been forced into, the power of the moment we finally see her full head of hair, an iconic marker for her character and a symbol for her freedom, after nearly 10 minutes of it being tucked away. The fact that the only way she can actually shoot an arrow is by literally ripping the symbol of her oppression apart at the seams. Curse this dress! God, this is such a good scene. All the parts that have been set up fit together so naturally and hint at the directions the film can continue to build on it. Remember that stern walk that the film set up as a visualization for the queen's power? Well, here it is again at the pinnacle of their first confrontation, while both are armed with their preferred method of power. The film even goes so far as to frame Eleanor in her stride through the bow. Behind the safety of her bow, her weapons and particularly her bow being a symbol for her hard power, Merida is able to face her mother's authority. In fact, I would even argue that the whole thing with her having to take a deep breath and focus for that last arrow has less to do with getting a bullseye, even one through another arrow, and more to do with standing up to her mother, who at this point is at full stride. The walk increasing in aggression as Eleanor starts to lose her control over the situation and desperately attempts to regain it, she goes from speaking somewhat gracefully to walking sternly to speaking aggressively with a threat. Merida, I forbid it! And it seems the only reason Merida is able to stand up to her mother at this point is because she has this weapon in her hand. And with it, she publicly contradicts her for the first time.
This is the real struggle of the film. Merida learning what's necessary to stand up to her mother and society. I've just about had enough of you, lass. And to emphasize that this was just a small victory and that Merida still has a long way to go, in the next scene when she's still full of adrenaline, she miscalculates her current authority and rips a symbol or even the symbol of her mother's soft power. I'll never be like you. No, stop that. I'd rather die than be like you. <gasps> and what does her mother do? The walk returns, and this time it works. Look at Merida Cower. Eleanor uses this moment of power to get rid of Merida's weapon, specifically her bow, the tool Merida just used so effectively to stand up to her. We get a triumphant close-up with the bow, Pan glaring close-up with the mother. So it's no surprise in the very next scene she would get rid of that bow. <laughs> Honestly, this is all pretty amazing. So far, the film has set up a hell of a complex conflict, and there's no real villain because society is the true villain. This whole sequence is the perfect inciting incident. It was a conscious decision Merida made. Her relationship with her mother has now crossed a threshold. There's no going back. And it drops the early hints of both of their character arcs. Merida's cower was the moment she realized she went too far. And the queen gets an even more explicit one as she tries to salvage the burning bow. Oh no, oh my God. Showing her subsequent regret. While praising the finished film, Amanda Marcotte defended the other plot, the one the film actually follows, stating, A lesser film would have made Merida's plot to outman the men at archery the end of the story. But I think that kind of misses the point. She isn't outmanning the men, because she isn't even competing with the men. She's competing with her mother, and they're each using their own strengths. The film emphasizes this dichotomy because the only characters with any type of depth are Merida and her mother. Everybody else is basically a caricature pieces on a chessboard in this game between mother and daughter. This was honestly less Pixar's take on the princess movie and more of A Man for All Seasons or Beckett by way of Pixar, using interpersonal relationships within the context of political struggles to discuss larger themes on society and more intimate themes on opposing viewpoints of life. And I'll say it again, it was amazing. Mother Bear. Come taste my blade, you manky bear, for gobbling up my leg. I'll hunt you, then I'll skin you, hang your noggin on a peg. I didn't ask her to change you into a bear, I just wanted her to change you. This is the point at which Merida runs off, meets the witch, and without intending it, turns her mother into a bear. In a cinema blend feature, Christy Puchko talks about the atmosphere following the press screening in New York City. Some of my fellow critics bellowed about what a miss and failure Brave was. And in all that squabbling, one moment was repeatedly harped upon. Her mother turned into a bear. If you haven't seen the film and you're just following along, I cannot overstate just how much this moment deflates the film. All these years later, I still remember the collective ennui that everyone in the cinema settled into when it was revealed that this is what the movie was going to focus on. They took a storyline that just put you at peak entry, one that made you genuinely curious about how it was going to develop, and then they introduced one so rote that before Merida even realizes that the bear is her mother, the next 30 minutes of the film have already played out in your head. You're a bear! You know without a doubt what the film needs to do for this new story to at least function. You have the initial confusion followed by the slapstick and the escape from the castle. You have the bear acting like a human. You have them trying to find the witch. You have them getting an info dump on how the magic works and what they need to do. You have the low bit when they're emotionally distraught. 
followed by the high bit of them connecting, preferably in a montage with some happy sounding indie music. And you have one more magic info dump with the stakes raising, so on and so on. By the time we've reached the climax with the bear being chased by everyone in the rain, we're so far removed from where we were that it might as well be a completely different film. Completely different film. Completely different film. 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 That it might as well be a completely different film. You have the initial confusion followed by the slapstick. You have the bear acting like a human. You have them getting an info dump on how the magic works and what they need to do. You have the low bit when they're emotionally distraught, followed by the high bit of them connecting, preferably in a montage with some happy sounding indie music. And you have one more magic info dump with the stakes raising, so on and so on. By the time we've reached the climax with the bear being chased, we're so far removed from where we were that it might as well be a completely different film. That it might as well be a completely different film. Hollywood, can we retire this fucking plot? The plot bear bear plot doesn't work on a number of levels. Remember this three-way relationship that was set up? The plot completely removes society from the equation, disempowering her mother. While the queen is a bear, they are not on equal footing. It's no longer the game of wit that was set up earlier. You could say, oh, but the point was now with the mother out of the way, Merida has to step up. And I would agree, but that story beat was supposed to happen regardless, and the bear thing just needlessly complicates things. You could say, oh, but they bond over the struggle of the mother being a bear, and they have to adapt to this situation. But that's like my least favorite defense for any story, because two characters can bond while solving any problem. Merida and Eleanor could have bonded over baking a cake throughout the film. It doesn't really justify the plot they decided to focus on. What the bear plot plot bear does is it shifts the film's focus from this high tension conflict in which Eleanor and Merida held fundamentally opposing views to this McGovern scavenger hunt for clues to turn the mother back into a human? I know you're scared, you're tired, you don't understand, but we've got to keep our heads. In the next chapters I'm gonna talk about structure and character arcs and theme and story flow and all the important stuff. Now. I just want to complain. Because the rest of the film's running time is used to set up an internal logic for a spell that the film clearly doesn't have much confidence in. So please indulge me. Why a bear? Oh, that scaffy witch gave me a gammy spell. Why does the witch's spell turn everyone into a bear? That seems pretty random. No story reason is specified. Maybe because everyone else in the film hates bears? Or perhaps it turns you into what you're most afraid of. I'm sure there's some reason that makes sense, right? We had these questions come up of why a bear? Why does the spell always turn people into bears? And finally just made her this wood carver and all she carves was bears because she's just obsessed and just left it at that. Ah, so for all we know, the witch is a furry and has a bear fetish. Which like, I'm not shaming. Fine, let's say ultimately it doesn't really matter why it's a bear. So then. The witch gave us the answer, the tapestry. What does the tapestry have to do with the witch? It's not like the tapestry was a cursed artifact or had a spell or some supernatural effect on it, like the rose or the petals. As far as it's set up, this has absolutely nothing to do with this. They are mutually exclusive for the whole film until a connection is made. Split, like the tapestry. A connection I find as flimsy as... Save Martha! You might say, oh chill, it was just a symbolic connection. But that's definitely not the case. This was subtext. And this was subtext. But this and this are absolutely key plot elements. They have to go back and physically stitch it up. What actually happened here with the tapestry was that in a previous version of the script, there was a plot point where the magical relics relevant to the wording of the spell had been sewn into the tapestry by the mother. But then they changed the words of the spell and never removed the tapestry as a plot point. Mend the bond torn by pride. And now it just sits there begging you not to think about it. By the second sunrise, your spell will be permanent. <gasps> you know, if Merida had to stitch it up, then did the prince in his time have to like, super glue it? 
This whole scene is everything coming together, right? She's realizing the story that mom told her is true because here's the evidence, but not only that, it's what the witch said about a prince that came that asked for the strength of the 10 men. Oh my God, it's the same freaking guy. Save Martha. So it's all like, kind of big epiphany on her face, right? Martha! And, and that terror, that that sinking feeling. Oh no. That we go, the stakes just got bigger in the movie. Martha! By the way, as a side note, since one of the symbols was given so much significance, you would assume the other one would be made more important too. You know, the one the film equates in value to the tapestry and then proceeds to use as the first sign for the mother's doubt. But no, that's completely forgotten about. And when the bear plot kicks in, Merida just has a new bow. Look, I'm aware I've just been nitpicking for the past 5 minutes, and I feel no shame about that. Because as I said, the film stops dead in its tracks to set up and solve the mystery of how the witch's spell works, so the least they could do was have it make sense in some way. At its core, yes, I think the bear plot plot bear is inherently dumb, but my main issue is that I just wanted the two halves to feel like they belong to the same film. Say what you will about Brother Bear, but by the time the switch happens, it had been really set up, both plot-wise and character-wise. It felt cohesive. In Brave, the whole shift just doesn't ring true to almost anything the film was doing up to that point. By the end, when they're back at the castle and the marriage comes up again, you're just like, What is this? The story's pacing feels like... Alright, stick with me for a second. It feels like a car that has limited petrol and is on a street approaching a roundabout. The plan is to continue straight, but it missed the exit when the bear plot got introduced. Now it has to make its way all the way around explaining the different magical elements. Then it gets back to the exit it originally wanted to get on, and it tries to continue the thematic beats it had set up on the main route, but now there's only 15 minutes left and it has to rush everything. This is all a result of the film's structure. If you look at its timeline, you can see that it's basically split its running time in half to accommodate for two different plots. And when the bear happens, is there any f moment of like waiting to make sure that you haven't lost them? Or you're comfy cozy? I'm comfy cozy. Julian and sadness are gone. I have to do stupid dream duty. I'm the princess. I'm the example. Yeah, I'm used to that one. Born descendant of Clan Dumbrock, and I'll be shooting for my own hand. What are you doing? <gasps> Boo! Pick a plot line. Let's say, for the sake of brevity, that there is a story and the way it manifests itself is through its plot. So, in this case, these two plots have the same base story. A mother and daughter are at odds with each other. A conflict arises as a result, and lessons are learned as they overcome it. Is there something that connects the two plots in the film? Yeah, sure. There are these transitional scenes. The second plot uses scenes from the first plot as an inciting incident, and since the introduction of the second plot follows the strongest sequence in the film, which ends with possibly the strongest scene in the film, we're on board, and we want to go where the film takes us. Now, does that connection make- No! Each of these plots develops the story in different, almost contradictory ways. This is most obvious when we break down the character arcs in each plot. For example, let's look at Merida's. In the first plot, Merida is the one being wronged by her mother and society by extension. After trying and failing to solve the situation with the full force that she's used to, she must adapt her methods, overcome her flaws, and find a viable solution that combines her own character traits with some of her mother's methods. In the second plot, feeling Eleanor was never there for her, Merida wrongs her mother and makes a big mistake. And in the process of undoing that mistake, she must learn that she was wrong all along about how she saw her mother. Notice a problem here. These are two serviceable plots with functioning character arcs. One is clearly superior, but on their own, they're fine. But when you try to put them together in one film, you end up making Merida's character arc muddier than this poor Pixar employee's face. For example, in the climax of the film, when Merida says, You've always been there for me. What? Always? Not in this story. Not in the way Merida defined it earlier. You're never there for me, 
see, this whole marriage is what you want. Do you ever bother to ask what I want? No! And she's right. Eleanor hasn't been there for her in the story we've seen so far. But the problem is, this beat appears at a different point in each character arc. On top of that, one plot requires Merida to be right. Her mother was in fact oppressing her, so that Merida can rightfully stand up to her mother and stop the marriage. Whereas the other plot requires Merida to be wrong, for this to be a false read of the situation stemming from Merida's character flaws, so that she can realize her mistake at the end of the film. And it gets really messy when the film tries to meld both character arcs into one scene. The big speech scene. Here, Merida shows mastery over the soft power or diplomatic skills that her mother basically had a monopoly on in the first half. She walks in with the grace that is want of her mother and unites the four clans. That she does so through stories about their victories when they were united is a good callback to the mother storytelling earlier. And that it's all done in a way to feed into their masculine egos is also a nice touch. This is probably the way it would have happened even if there was no bear plot. But the mastery Merida's showing kind of comes out of nowhere. If this was Merida's first attempt to play within her mother's rules, and this was supposed to be the big character arc climax, there clearly should have been at least one more moderate attempt or build up or something in between the two. It's especially weird when you consider how much setup there was for that first attempt. We knew Merida loves to shoot arrows, we knew she's rambunctious, we saw how stifled she was by the whole marriage situation, we saw her put two and two together and then come up with the idea of choosing archery. We even saw her get ready for that plan. We learned that she was smart and capable, but also that she has a tendency to not think things through to the end. This scene, which is supposed to be the next major step, has none of that. There's no build up, there's no intelligence, there's no continuity, there's just this, out of the blue. And the truth is, there's no adjustment you could do to this scene to fix that problem, because it's a structural problem. Is that so? Aye, it is. See, this scene is caked on either side by this stupid bear plot. If we zoom out, we can see the two plots are interweaved together in such a way where the first plot is basically abandoned altogether to develop the second, less interesting one. That one is stopped dead in its tracks so the first plot can get some type of conclusion, which they then hope to transition in some way to the second plot's conclusion. And trying to conclude both plots within minutes of each other leads to what is by far the biggest issue with this scene. I've been selfish. I tore a great rift in our kingdom. There's no one to blame but me. And I know now that I need to amend my mistake and mend our bond. And so there is the matter of my betrothal. I've decided to do what's right. She's basically on the verge of going through with the marriage, making you wonder what the fuck she actually learned. Near the highest point of her victory, Merida is suddenly forced to turn 180 degrees, admit fault for an entirely different plot, and try to correct it by doing the exact opposite of what she should be doing at this moment. The film has these character arcs intersect at the point when they couldn't be farther apart. I've been selfish. I tore a great rift in our kingdom. There's no one to blame but me. I need to amend my mistake. And mend our bond. There is the matter of my betrothal. I've decided to do what's right. It's just a mess. Throughout the entire conclusion, when Merida says stuff like, I've been selfish. There's no one to blame but me. This is all my fault. That's the film equating the marriage protest with the potion in one big confused menagerie of meaning streamlining them through cliché dialogue and sad music to trigger a familiar feeling of stories with more coherent conclusions, and hopefully masking the fact that this climax is playing with emotional peaks it has not earned. We thought we needed to spend the time with them so that they can earn their reward at the end. They could, they could actually have a longer journey. But we get every moment, and by the end they still earn this, this journey. With all this, there's the added benefit of having the last 10 minutes of the film play out like, it's all my fault. Nah, chill, you don't need to get married. Yay! Wait, it really is all my fault. Nah, I said chill, I'm no longer a bear. Yay! <gasps> the tapestry! But if Merida's character arc is complicated and muddies the themes of the film, it's Eleanor who really bears the brunt of it. 
I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. fucking I'm so sorry. 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 sorry about that. I'm so sorry about that. In the first plot, you have a mother who feels compelled by tradition to force her daughter into marrying. Despite her efforts, she's unable to connect with her daughter. At the end, after she sees Merida take what she's taught her and give it new life, she reconsiders how she saw her. She's filled with pride for her daughter and comes to terms with how she had been unintentionally oppressing her. In the second plot, she's mean and old school and then she gets turned into a bear and becomes hip and nice afterwards. I'm sorry, I know I'm oversimplifying, but there just isn't that much in this plot. Her arc here starts her in regal clothes with braids, then she's a bear and out of her element, and then the film just ends with these quick shots of her with her hair let loose riding a horse alongside her daughter. This ending is one of the worst cases of character derailment I've ever seen, and the change she goes through is superficial at best. I just don't understand why they felt the only way they could show Eleanor's approval is by having her morph into a version of her daughter. Wouldn't it have been a lot stronger to continue in the direction the first plot had set up, showing that the difference between them is fundamental to their characters? Eleanor doesn't understand it at her core, she may never understand it, but her love for her daughter goes beyond her inability to get it. By the end, she learns to accept and approve of who Merida is even if that may clash with who she is, or who she expected her daughter to be. What parent, what, what person hasn't gone through that experience with a loved one, hasn't been confronted with some part of the other's character that they just don't get, and hasn't had to eventually learn to overcome it and realize that that person means more to you than your inability to understand. You can't change them. You need to adapt and accept them for who they are. And despite the fact that you could say your love for them was undeniable, when you re-examine the dynamic, you might realize that without ever intending it, you were harming them, oppressing their self-expression, stifling their growth. So you need to make changes in the way you see them and what you expect of them. You need to be supportive. This is a difficult lesson to learn, but it was a lesson I needed to learn. Eleanor needed to learn. <clears throat> that last paragraph might have had to do with more than brave. N nonetheless, it was Eleanor's lesson to learn here. But the film throws all of that away. You know, there were earlier versions of the character with hints that she was actually like Merida, but they did the smart thing of removing those elements of her character. The Eleanor were presented with in the film never felt a desire to let loose like her daughter. This wasn't her big problem. What she wanted and kept failing to do was to empathize with her daughter. Merida? Mom? Just remember to smile. She wasn't going to tell Merida that in fact what she always wanted to do was to stay single and let my hair flow in the wind as I ride through the glen. No, she was trying to connect with her daughter, which she couldn't do because she never listened to her. Just listen! I am the queen. You listen to me. Oh! Then after the speech scene, Eleanor realizes that Merida was listening to her and in fact that she herself was the one not listening. So yeah, the speech scene in itself actually hits the right character beat for Eleanor. But then it just keeps going and tries to conclude her arc in the same scene. And ironically, it does so at the expense of Merida's character arc. The film contorts Merida's arc to this ridiculous point. I decided to do what's right. Just so Eleanor can interrupt and express the fact that her opinions on the marriage have changed. I concede that having Merida listen to her mother when she can't speak is a playful story beat. But within that story beat is the implication of Eleanor literally dictating Merida's earlier opinion back to her, which I'm sure was intended as Eleanor showing her support, but instead it comes off as if the only reason Merida is able to break with tradition is because now she has her mother's approval. The most admirable thing from the earlier attempt was that Merida was adamant about how she felt and stood up to everybody for what she believed in. Not a single character in the film was on her side. That Eleanor has this sudden change of heart and that the reason the marriage doesn't happen is because she basically wills it not to happen kind of kills the core conflict. And make no mistake, that change of heart that Eleanor has comes out of nowhere. The last time it was brought up was like 30 minutes ago. Of course, we both know a decision still has to be made. And just like with Merida's arc, nothing in the intervening sequences has been about it. The only relevant thing that has happened were these close-ups during Merida's speech, which feel like the biggest downgrade considering the intense self-reflection the earlier scene was hinting at. And it's not like Merida has done anything to change her mother's opinion. And if you fucking say that dumb fishing scene, Unless the marriage plot would have developed in an entirely different direction in the absent second act, this scene should have been all about Merida. As far as Eleanor is concerned, this scene would perhaps be the final turning point for how she saw the situation, but she shouldn't play an active role in it. 
Instead, the equivalent of this scene should have belonged to Eleanor, where she recontextualizes their relationship, expressing that she had actually wronged her daughter and that she's proud of what her daughter has become. Now you could say, oh, that's impossible, giving the big emotional climax to the character who is ostensibly not the protagonist. Yeah, you, you could say that in, in those exact words. And maybe I would agree, but Pixar has done this before. In WALL-E, the emotional climax of the film when Eve saves WALL-E actually played out in a different way. Originally, the roles were reversed. WALL-E in a last ditch effort saves Eve. But while watching the film at a preview screening, Stanton realized something. It dawned on me that I had made a big mistake and that Wally should really be the one that's hurt, not Eve. Wally. I needed Eve to finally express in some way, because I don't have dialogue, that her directives have changed. She now cares more about him than whatever her programming was telling her to do all along to that point. So Eve is the key character in the emotional climax of the film, the literal equivalent of this scene. Stanton took a look at his two main characters and realized that the more significant character arc in the story he's telling actually belongs to the deuter, der, de, 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 the character who is ostensibly not the protagonist of his film, and he makes the adjustment his story requires. Similarly, Eleanor technically goes through the larger change between the two. Seeing how well that dynamic turned out in Wally, there's no reason it wouldn't have worked well in Brave if it was given enough room to develop correctly. Instead, we get the turning point and conclusion of Eleanor's character arc all in one scene because we have to rush off to conclude that other plot. <gasps> the tapestry. A film with a divided structure will eventually lead to a divided conclusion. Which, you know, makes you wonder if the core vision for the film was just as divided. Wait a minute. This is our first female, it's a female heroine, and we're having Mark Andrews direct it. The very, <laughs> as far from a female point of view as we can get. But it's not a female, you uh -huh. know? Gender has nothing to do with this movie. Brave was originally developed by Brenda Chapman, a veteran in the animation industry. She was one of the creative leads on The Lion King and co-director of Prince of Egypt. She pitched Brave when she joined Pixar in the mid-2000s and based the story on the relationship with her daughter. But 18 months before the film's release, she was let go because of creative differences. So Mark Andrews was brought in to finish the film. Now, by all accounts, Andrews is a great fixer type. He's also a longtime collaborator of Brad Bird and has left his touch on a number of great films. It's honestly pretty impressive that he managed to take disparate elements of the project and work them around into a finished film in 18 months. But with the introduction of a new vision, the film was suddenly being framed in a very different way. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. And so we treated it without gender. Although I can see the argument in wanting to focus on Merida as just a strong character regardless of gender, I feel they pushed it so far in the opposite direction, putting them firmly in thou doth protest too much territory. Surely it's obvious by now how central the concept of gender actually is to the story they're telling? You can't take a story that starts off with a mother who feels compelled by tradition to force her daughter into marriage and match it with a vision that is trying to remove gender from the mix. Those two things are inherently incompatible. The central disagreement between Eleanor and Merida is at its core technically about what it means to be a woman in this world. A princess does not place her weapons on the table. Mom, it's just my bow. A princess should not have weapons. And as far as the tradition of the marriage is concerned, the only agency Merida gets in this life-altering decision is what challenge she gets to be a reward for. Archie! Archie! And this is all happening to her not just because she's royalty, but more specifically because she's the princess. By trying to be so adamant that gender isn't core to the story, they end up reaching some really bizarre places conceptually. By the end of the movie, she realizes all those things that her mother makes her do aren't so bad. You know, all those things her mother makes her do, like getting married. I decided to do what's right. Now, is it unfair to single out Andrews? Probably. There's a long history in Hollywood of directors getting replaced, even Pixar's done it before, and on some of their best films. And often there's no accurate way of knowing who changed what exactly. Except in this case, Andrews is more than happy to share with us the sweeping changes he made to Chapman's story. There were still elements of the script that were kept, and then I wrote the script, um, more do that whole element came up, what the, exactly the magic was and how it worked changed. And the main thing I did was uh, made it just merit a story, just made it about the teenager so I can have that straight through line and kind of cl clean up the, the balance of the story. It's baffling how well his list lines up with the worst elements in the film. But then again, he also takes credit for this great back and forth in the first act, so who knows? 
and it's not like all the bad ideas were his. The bear plot itself was Chapman's idea. From the very earliest pitch, you know, the, the basic structure was in place, and that, that has remained the same throughout. Even the idea of changing to a bear, that all came, that started to gel in that first year and a half or so of development. So if Chapman had continued with the bear plot, then the core problem of the film and its failed attempt at stitching these two distinct plots together would have probably stayed the same but it wouldn't also have had to deal with an identity crisis of what its core themes are. It seems that Chapman's original direction focused more on the mother-daughter relationship and less on the magic. So what the project really lost with her removal was a focused vision that matched the themes of the story it was telling. That Pixar replaced directors and tried to shift the focus away from a young woman's struggle in reshaping the gender-defined role she's been given and instead onto a mediocre magic plot says a lot. That it also happened on the project with the only female director Pixar had ever had says even more. I can do that coming in and being objective because it wasn't mine, right? I didn't, I didn't create it. If you really want to feel the disconnect, just put on the commentary track. When he jumped in, it'd be uh, 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 a bagpipe. And then a, then a groan. And then at a, the, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 In an interview years later, Chapman said, there was no reason creatively to take me off the film. I think it was just, bumping heads with John Lasseter was my downfall. And knowing what we know now, I'm inclined to believe her. Rumor at Pixar had it that Chapman had been indecisive, unconfident, and ineffective as a director. But one artist who had been on the Brave story team for years passionately countered that rumor, saying Chapman knew exactly what film she was making and was very clear in communicating her vision. From where I was sitting, the only problem with Brenda and her version of Brave was that it was a story told about a mother and daughter from a distinctly female lens. It's not a female, you right. know? Gender has nothing to do with this movie. Queen Eleanor is a working mom. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. She is not this quiet little wife sitting next to her husband. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. She is the diplomat. She's the one who basically calls the shots. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. Eleanor is a really interesting character, I think, because she's the peacemaker. She's a lot of the... Uh, brains behind the operation. Gender has nothing to do with this movie. Gender has nothing to do with this movie, right? Right, 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 right. right. What's this? What's this? There's color everywhere. What's this? There's white things in the air. What's this? I can't believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. Wake up, Jack. This isn't fair. What's this? So, what do we do now? Well, nothing. The film's been released for nearly a decade, and that's that. Bafflingly, it somehow won the Oscar that year, reminding us all what an incestuous cesspool that whole event is. But while putting this piece together, it made me wonder, hypothetically, if we could make changes, what changes would I make to the film? First thing you would have to do is remove one of the plots. Along with all the other problems it caused, the split timeline prevents the film from exploring either plot in any real way. 80 minutes is barely enough time to explore one plotline, let alone two. I think I've made it pretty clear that I don't like the bear plot, and I wish they focused on the story that started with the suitors. I'm not saying what I wanted was the tale of Princess Kaguya, but this time with mommy issues. Though, that doesn't sound that bad. But getting rid of the bear plot would allow us to focus on the escalating battle of wits between Eleanor and Merida that we spoke about in the beginning. One way you could do it is to hone in on the way Eleanor influences the leaders of the clans in the beginning of the film and contrast it with the way Merida influences them at the end. And along with that, perhaps over a subsequent attempt for her hand, Merida gets to know each of the sons a bit better in their own way, a skill she's shown she's capable of doing in a way her mother can't. I think this approach could work quite well because we're using a bunch of things the film already set up. You see, we spend quite a bit of time during the introduction of each son, and it's all clearly nonsense, false hype by the fathers. Along with that, we get Merida's initial impressions, her embarrassment at the arrogance, the furtive curiosity at the strength, etc. But everything is skewed by this terrible context she's been forced into, so she feels helpless. Then during the archery contest, we yet again spend all this time going son by son, getting all this characterization for each son, but in contrast to the previous scene, this is all within the context of what Merida knows best. Oh, we love. On top of that, since she's feeling confident because of her plan to undermine the whole thing, she just straight up mocks them, giving each one a custom roast and indulging in her father's prejudices of each clan. Since we have these two impressions she's been presented with, each false in its own way, why not have her get to know each of them a little bit for who they really are? In the process, she figures out that they're not completely okay with the marriage either. So when she talks about them in the climactic scene, she does so truthfully and rallies the sons together to stand up to their fathers. 
Give us our own say in choosing our fate. What? This results in that story beat no longer feeling like it comes out of nowhere. And instead of doing it in the boring, vague way she does in the film, she can go specific and meaningful. It's ironic because just before that, when talking with the fathers, her strength was her specificity. It didn't really matter that the fathers worked together in the past. No, what mattered is that McIntosh saved the king and that Dingwall broke the enemy line. With a mighty throw of his spear! I was aiming at you, you big chubsy! <laughs> she knew how to tug at their heartstrings and feed into their egos. So Merida proves to everybody, but especially to her mother, that peace amongst the clans and the marriage of the princess are not as interconnected as everyone thinks. But she also shows her mother something else. The first beat with the father shows Eleanor that Merida actually listened to her and knows all these things that Eleanor must have hammered into her over the years. Ah, uh, mom. The second beat with the sons shows her that Merida's gone further. She's listened to the sons and knows things that even Eleanor herself doesn't. She's adapted her mother's methods to fit her own character and work with her own situation. Eleanor's diplomacy relies on motherly authority, a shaming with the wag of her finger. Whereas Merida's diplomacy would be much more convivial, connecting with them on their level. This is also beautifully established way back in the beginning of the film in the scene at the dinner table, specifically with how everybody interacts with the triplets. The father bores them with retreads of the same past glory, then Merida in one fell swoop recontextualizes the story and livens them up. Look at the sheer joy on their cute little faces. Eleanor tells them in her motherly way to eat their haggis, but Merida knows what they actually want are the sweets, so she quietly passes it to them. What the triplets go through isn't too different from what the clans go through. With the king, they're stuck in the cycle of their past, boring tales of glory and prejudices that seem to repeat themselves ad infinitum. And with the queen, there's this motherly authority who expects them to keep up with the tradition of the marriage and act appropriately. Well, in comes Merida, reframing their past, giving it new life. The story of this kingdom is a powerful one. Then pointing out that the sons don't want the haggis of a forced marriage, but rather the sweets of the freedom to choose. It's really impressive when you think that all of this was done in a scene that is otherwise mostly exposition. It might seem like I'm reading too much into this one little scene, but films do this type of thing all the time. In fact, the cold open takes it a step further and basically parallels the timeline of the entire film, giving you a mini version of what happens. And even though that's really cool, I would actually change it and bring back the opening with baby Merida helping Eleanor work on the tapestry, or at least add that detail back in. So then after seeing the clans off, Merida rides back to the castle, and the film ends with a shot of her sitting next to her mother so they can mend the tapestry together. The only detail I would add is that during the emotional peak when Eleanor is having her big moment with Merida, telling her how proud she is and how much she loves her, she gives Merida the bow, the one she salvaged from the fire, showing that she no longer believes that a princess should not have weapons or what have you. Obviously this isn't the be all end all version of the film, the fact is there are so many directions you can take it. I also wrote out an entire section exploring different options focusing on the bear plot instead. <laughs> But then I cut it all out because I realized that every minute I spend thinking about the plot bear bear plot is a minute I consider wasted. I've had enough for you and your slippery ways. What? No, you're mocking me. I also know there are people who were super excited about the magical elements and the adventure aspect hinted at in the trailers. So that's also yet another direction you could take. It would require some significant changes to the first act because as we discussed, 30 minutes into an 80 minute film is just too late to suddenly introduce an entirely new plot without the risk of losing the audience. The real important thing is that whatever direction you choose, you would need to maintain a unity of vision with a singular focus, which the final film just didn't have. Looking back now, I can't help but be disappointed. It's easy for us to forget how different Brave was when it came out. The revolutionary fact that Merida was the first princess in a mainstream animated film to not end up with a man. It's easy to forget now that we have frozen self-aware writing. You got engaged to someone you just met that day? And Elsa, Moana, and Judy, who also didn't end up with a love interest. But Merida still stands out as the only one who was presented with the choice of a love interest and actively turned it down, as opposed to being progressive by omission. You can't help but think up what changes you would make to the plot because while watching it, there's this constant feeling that just beneath the surface is a version of this film that becomes an instant classic, that doesn't lean heavily on unnecessary tropes and lazy plots, that pushes mainstream animation films years ahead, and that proves that we don't have to go to Japan or to France to find a children's film that trusts its audience to empathize with the characters on the screen without having to pander to them with a plot they're already familiar with. And then after you're done watching it, reality sinks in, 
and you realize we didn't get that version. <laughs>